Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you can all hear me. You're welcome to um, this section on deep learning with Keras and TensorFlow in R. And I, I believe this one of the last section of the use our 2020 tutorial that we are actually really helping. And with us is um, Dr. Shereen, um joining us from Germany. She's a data scientist with um, Code Centric and also a co organizer of uh, Mucha uh, user group. So we'll be starting um, 1 p.m. dots. We'll be starting 1 p.m. dots. So just, just as we were sent in the mail, for as many of us that have, have any question, let's do well to um, go to GitHub. So you share your question on GitHub, and once it's time for um, Q&A, we're going to um, show the question open to the house. So please, let's ensure we unmute our mic. Um, if you have any question, feel free to go to GitHub, share your question, and you can also use the chat section too as well too. So I um, hope we're going to have you know, a productive section together. Yeah, thanks for your time. So once it's two o'clock, um, the facilitator will take the ground and we start the training. Good morning.
Okay, um, once again, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Fola Jimali from Lagos Our User Group. Um, you're welcome to this section on deep learning um, with cars and tensor flow in R. And with us is um, Dr. Sharon from Jamnin, and she's a data scientist with Code Centric. Um, she's also a co organizer of our Mucha um, R user group. So she'll be taking us through the section. Please um, do it to mute on your mic. And um, as was stated, if you have any question, do it to also use Gita, or you can as well share your questions on the chat. So we look forward to a productive section together. Enjoy the section. Thanks for your time. Over to you, I'm Shireen. Yes, thank you. And welcome everyone <laughs> to the workshop. I am very happy to have so many people interested in the workshop. It's actually quite more than I expected <laughs> would actually show up. So <laughs> I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah, so let's get started as there is not that much time, I guess. So um, this is the short overview what we'll be trying to cover in these two hours. So I will talk a little bit about me, not too long. Um, then there will be a short uh, theoretical introduction to neural networks and deep learning with Keras and TensorFlow. And the way I want to handle this is that I will try to keep the explanations pretty brief during the theoretical part because I think it kind of gets boring if I talk too much and don't show you enough code. So I will try to keep the explanations short um, and then go over to the coding section. And I would encourage you to ask questions anytime you like, but um, if it's not a really urgent question, um, try to save the questions for the, theor for the practical part when we actually go to our studio and code something. Because there I also provide a lot of um, written explanations that you can read up on later and you will get the GitHub repository with all the material in it. So even if there is something that you don't get, you can always read up on it later and look over it again. So because there is not that much time, I, I decided, can you please mute yourself, everyone? Thank you. So I decided that we will focus on convolutional neural networks today and um, try to go as much into detail as you would like. And there is a lot of extra stuff. I don't assume that we will be able to cover the entire code that, it's in, that is in the GitHub repository because of time, but I thought I will start. And the workshop is designed in a way that we can go as fast as you like, basically. If there are not that many questions, we can go really fast and cover a lot of topics. But if there are questions, then I would rather go into detail on the few things that we do cover, and you will have the chance to look at all the additional stuff on your own later. All right, just a few words about me. Um, Fola Jimmy already introduced me briefly. I'm a data scientist at a German um, IT consulting company. I have been a data scientist now for three years, but before that, I actually started out, out as a biologist and a bioinformatician. So I don't have the really, uh, <laughs> I have a kind of side entrance, you might say, um, into data science. So my background is mostly statistics and uh, data visual visualization and traditional modeling, but I also um, have been working a lot with machine learning and um, deep learning during the last years. And I find it all very fascinating, the things you can do with data and hope to uh, convey some of this fascination with you today. So just a few words, what you will learn in this workshop, hopefully the basics of deep learning um, a few words that you might en um, encounter when you talk about deep learning are cross entropy loss, activation functions, optimizations of weights and biases, back propagation, gradient descent. All these words are usually thrown around when people talk about deep learning and I'm trying to give you a short overview of what these things are and why they are relevant to, to um, building neural networks with Keras. And then, of course, the interesting part, how to build the deep neural networks with Keras and TensorFlow and how to 
use these models later on to um, make predictions on test data and do some additional cool stuff. So the scripts and code you will get in later once we um, once we um, did the theoretical part. So you will get the link then. But first, let me talk a little bit about neural networks. And before we actually start with neural networks, I just want to briefly um, classify how I think of machine learning. Typically, when I give a workshop, we have the three pillars of machine learning, which are supervised learning. So the most of the common um, tasks that you will encounter are called supervised under the column supervised learning. So everything that is a classification or regression task where you have labeled data is called supervised learning because you have a known truth that you try to model with data and you will try to have a model learn from the data to be able to learn a mathematical representation of this data basically to get the, to, to the labels you know so that you can then use this learned representation on new data and make predictions. So in case you want to predict classes, we call this classification. Um, and in case you want to predict like numeric values, we call this usually regression. And this is also what we will focus on in this tutorial. So we will only be covering supervised learning classification tasks. A bit more advanced usually are unsupervised learning where we have unlabeled data. So we don't know the truth as you can call it. So um, things you usually do when you talk about unsupervised learning are clustering um, dimensionality reduction like PCA or multidimensional scaling um, or also anomaly detection. And reinforcement is often the third pillar of machine learning. This is where we have more or less self-generating data um, like a computer game that we can um, have a computer play on its own for thousands and thousands of rounds. And what we give this computer then is a reward and you know, punishment setup. And the computer will then play against itself again, again, and again, and try to get the highest reward in this way, learn some task. So just a few short words about neural networks, because this is basically what we will be building with Keras um, in a minute. So neural networks are one of the many algorithms that you can use to do this machine learning. So to have a computer learn the mathematical representation of data. So actually what we are using are artificial neural networks because they have been built to mimic the learning patterns of our brains. So the neural networks of our brains are basically what we are trying to copy so that we can use the complexity of, of the structure of our brain to learn from data in an artificial way. The very most simple type of neural network can, is called a perceptron. And the very simple perceptron would consist of some input data, um, some weights, maybe a bias. Then we all combine this, go have it go through an activation function so that an output is calculated. And the trick basically is that we can change these weights. And changing these weights will then change the output. And I will talk more in detail what this actually means in the next slides. So activation functions. Um, there are a lot of activation functions. I will just talk very briefly about a few of them. Some you will um, often encounter are, for example, the sigmoid activation function or rectified linear units, in short, RADU. And these two examples show you what an activation function does. It is basically just a transformation of an input. So let's say we have input data going into our neural network. Let's say we have 10 input values. Each of them is multiplied with a weight. And we sum all these input data multiplied by weight up. So we have a number, basically, that's coming out, an input. So depending on what this number of our input is, let's say it is 5, and we would end up here on our x scale, this input data would get transformed. And you see the sigmoid activation function would transform our input data to lie between 0 and 1. 
Another commonly used activation function, the ReLU, does something very simple. It basically keeps the input as it is, as long as it's above zero, and everything that is below zero will be set to zero. So an input of minus 10 would become zero, an input of minus five would also become zero. There are more and more activation functions, and they're usually used for specific cases. And we will talk about specific uses of activation functions when we go to the coding section. But why I'm talking about them here is that I want to explain the concept of why we are actually using these activation functions in neural networks. And the reason is that we can use these activation functions to break linearity. If we did not have them and we would just have our input going into the perceptron, we would not be able to really do something interesting with the, with the data to calculate an interesting output. We would just be able to have a linear representation between input and output. But if we use complex or at least activation functions that transform the input in a certain way, we are able to achieve nonlinear combinations and therefore be able to learn more complex tasks than just with linearity. So the simplest type of um, artificial neural network that we can also build with Keras is called a multi-layer perceptron. And this multi-layer perceptron consists of an input layer where we have our input data and then feed it into a set of hidden layers. And there can be basically any number of hidden layers um, and any number of nodes in each hidden layer. So here we have an example of three hidden layers where we have four nodes, two nodes, and again, four nodes in our hidden layers. And in each of these nodes, our input data will get transformed. So the special type of layer we are using here is called a dense layer, where every input gets um, sent to the next hidden layer in every node. So you can see here, input number one will go to the first node, the second, the third, and the fourth, and so on for every other layer until we get to the output. And the way um, neural networks learn now, so the learning process that we want, the learning of the mathematical representation between input and the known output is by changing the weights in a certain way, by optimizing these weights, so that the output will be as close to what we expect it to be. And how this works is like this. So here we have a classification example where we have our input data, we have a weight, we don't need to have a bias, but often we do. So the most important things are input and weight now, and the output that we know. So let's say we go to our fruits example that we will use in the coding um, part later. And we know that each image can belong to, let's say the class apple, banana, or um, pear. So we have now three classes. And what we will do is we know, first of all, we know that um, let's say image one contains uh, or shows a banana, but it could also potentially show, so the neural network thinks it could be a banana, an apple or a pear. So what will happen now in the neural network is that it will send the data through the neural network. So the image data through the neural network and calculate the output. And the output is basically a score. So let's say a number. This could, for example, be a two for class banana, a one for class apple, and 0.1 for class pear. So just on its own, this doesn't really help the computer that much because this, these numbers can vary in size. So that we don't really, they are not standardized. In order to achieve the standardization, we use the softmax activation function. And here you have another example of an activation function that transforms the input. And what the softmax does, it will um, transform the score into a probability. So let's say here, um, the score two will get transformed into 0.7, the score of one into 0.2, and the score 0.1 will stay 0.1. You can look up um, the, ma the mathematical function of softmax. It's not that complicated, but I don't think it will add to that much here. What is important to know is that the probability you will get out 
will sum up to one. So this means you will always have one number that is higher than the others. And what we tell the neural network or assume the neural network will make of these probabilities now is that the highest number is the predicted class. So in this case, the neural network will think, okay, I calculated 0 0.7 for class one, uh, 0 0.2 for class two and 0 0.1 for class three. So I am assuming this image shows what is class A, in this case, a banana. And we know that this is correct. So we have in the next case, again, our probability distribution, but we also have the correct state of this image. So the first part is just, as, just the same as I showed you before, the probability distribution from the softmax function. And the one hot encoded vector is what we use to display the so-called truth. So we know that our image belongs to class A, showing a banana, so we give it a one. And we know that it's not class B and also not class C. So this is a case where we have an exclusive classification. So we can only predict one of several classes for our image. And what you can see if you compare this one hot encoded vector to the probability distribution is that it shares a few very important um, characteristics. And the most important is that it sums up to one, just as the probability distribution. It will sum up to one. Can't be larger, can't be smaller, it has to sum up to one. So now we can use a neat trick, but we can subtract them from each other and calculate the distance or what we call cross entropy between the two. Because you could think that, let's say our neural network made a perfect prediction. Then it would have a score that gets uh, converted into a probability distribution where the, the perfect class, the right class, would have a probability of one. And because it has to sum up to one, all the other class would have to be zero. So in a perfect case scenario, our, our neural network would have predicted class A to be one and the other class is to zero. And if we now use the distance, it's very easy to see that in a perfect case, the distance would be zero because one minus one, zero minus zero and zero minus zero. So of course, in reality, we rarely have that perfect a case. So if we use our example here and we calculate the distance, um, it, it will have a certain small distance. And what we want to do during model training now is to adjust the weights and the bias in a way that reduces the distance between our probability distribution and the one not encoded vector. And not just for one image, but for a set of thousands of images. And in this way, average the cross entropy over our entire training set so that we will have a loss that is as small as possible. And how this works now is using backpropagation. And this is all relatively complex and I'm going very briefly over this. I don't expect you to understand every word I'm saying if this is completely new to you. Um, but the, I don't have the object that you really need to understand backpropagation and gradient descent here 100%. Just have these words in mind, try to keep in mind things like softmax function and uh, one-hot encoded vector because these are things that you will encounter later on if you are building your Keras model. And then it's good to at least have heard the words and have a bit of an understanding what they are doing and you can read up more details once you actually need it. But for now, just um, keep in mind that backpropagation is going backwards through our neural network. So once we start, our data goes in from left to right through all the hidden layers until we get to the output. We do what I just showed. We calculate the score, um, have it converted into a prediction uh, and into a pr probability, prediction probability compared with the one-hot encoded vector. And this distance, the error or cross entropy now has to be back propagated through the neural network from right to left so that we can calculate the, um, the error part that each neuron has. Because each neuron is associated with a weight, we need to know the error landscape, we call it, for each neuron so that we can adjust the weight in the correct um, direction. And adjusting the weight in the correct direction 
is done via optimization and the simplest, most often used optimization is called gradient descent. So what gradient descent does, the first part you should already be familiar with. So we had our neural network, we had our known one not encoded vector compared against the predicted output. We had our error and now we have this error landscape where we back propagated the error through our neural network. And we now you can think of it as a, let's say a, a landscape with valleys and um, hills. And we have a hiker who is our neural network and our neural network is blind. So the hiker gets blindfolded and we use a helicopter and drop the hiker somewhere in this hills and valleys landscape. And what the task of this hiker or the neural network, so let's think of this neural network as the, the hiker now, is to find the place with the lowest value. So the, the global minimum, because the, you can think of the, the landscape as the error landscape. So the lower you go in the landscape, the lower your error. And that's what you want to achieve. You would want to find the mathematical representation of your neural network where the error is as low as possible. So the global minimum of the error landscape. And the neural network would, do, would go about the similar as this blindfolded hiker. It's he is blind and he now wants to know where do I have to go to reduce the error? So he is blind and just has to feel around himself. Where is it steepest? So where do I have to make a step to reduce the error as much as possible in the next step? Because we only think in steps. We don't go from um, one point to the global minimum in, in one step. We use several steps, just as a hiker would. He would not jump in one one leap, he would have to take several steps. So the first step he feels around himself, goes to the place where it's steepest, and we start the whole process again. So we now can think of the next step as our updated weights. We go through the entire process again, we calculate the output, compare it with the known output, have an error, and again, look around, where is the error steepest? And this is being repeated ideally until we find a place where we cannot go any, any steeper and assume that we now have found the optimal um, place in our error landscape. So the optimal combination of weights to achieve the lowest error as possible. Of course, in reality, it's, it gets a bit more complicated because there are things like saddle points and local minima where you might think you cannot go steeper anymore, but that's just because you are in a valley that will go and you would have to go through an, over another hill to go even deeper again. So there are ways you can um, overcome this problem and we will talk about a few of them later but for now just remember that you are trying to find the lowest error and you adjust your weights in a way that reduces this error. So this was just really 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 brief because we wanted to talk about the interesting things which is hands-on deep learning with Keras and TensorFlow. And you can do a lot of cool stuff with neural networks and Keras and TensorFlow. You can do object recognition and images and videos. You can um, create uh, classification tasks for images, for text. You can even generate text. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with deep neural networks. And um, Keras is very suitable to do a lot of these things because Keras is made to um, enable fast prototyping of neural networks. So this means it's a high level API. Um, it's originally been developed for Python, but uh, it also works with R because R uses a package called Reticulate to um, basically create a conda environment on your computer and um, run Python in the background. So you actually run the Python Keras in the background, but you don't know it because you have the Keras R package that makes use of this, um, this background conda environment. What's also interesting about Keras is that it works on top of different backends, so you don't have to use TensorFlow as a backend, but usually people do because Keras is basically designed to work with TensorFlow and TensorFlow even recognized this in a way that it includes Keras as part of its um, core image as of TensorFlow 2.0 and larger. So if you install TensorFlow, you automatically have Keras installed and you automatically um, it's automatically designed to use Keras with TensorFlow because the the big advantage of Keras over just bare TensorFlow is that it's more high level it allows you to um, 
define neural networks in a more abstract way. So you're much faster in building neural networks and changing certain things and going from idea to finished model. Yeah, it enables fast and easy prototyping. And um, another interesting thing about Keras is, this, is that it's um, highly modular and this makes it very flexible. And what this actually means, you will see later because um, you will see this when we talk about layers. And still Keras is really powerful. You can do a lot of the more advanced networks with Keras. You can do ConfNets, you can do RNNs, you can even do LSTMs. You can do multiple input, multiple output. You can do a lot of really cool stuff with Keras. So this doesn't mean just because it's easy and fast doesn't mean it's less powerful. And of course, if you want to run, um, if you want to train more complex or bigger models, you can also use TensorFlow and Keras um, to run on a GPU. TensorFlow itself <coughs> has originally been developed by Google Brain. It's also an open source software for deep learning. And why it's called TensorFlow is because it's based on tensors and on flowcharts. So this means tensors are the, the most important thing for neural networks if you work with Keras and TensorFlow. And we call a tensor basically anything that is a multidimensional array. If you ask a mathematician, he will probably uh, <laughs> cry in his sleep because mathematicians, I've been told, have a more strict definition of what a tensor is. But for us machine learning and data scientists, um, it's enough to know that a tensor is a multidimensional array. So it can be one dimensional, like a vector, can be two dimensional, like a matrix, can be three dimensional, like an um, RGB image. And the really nice thing about tensors is that they can be processed in parallel. So we can do matrix multipl multiplications with tensors and we can process them in parallel. So we have the option of going of scaling them, the calculations very well. So here are examples for multidimensional multi um, arrays. And the graph part of TensorFlow, so the flow graphs, um, just mean that we have a computational graph to represent our mathematical operations. So we have certain nodes that mean certain um, operations, how the data get transformed, just a mathematical operation, can be anything. Usually it's a mat matrix multiplication. And uh, we have input, so a tensor, any multidimensional array can be an input. We do something with it, some mathematical magic, <laughs> and we get an output, another tensor. And this is how the information flows through our graph. Um, if you want to build models with Keras, the first decision you will have to make is whether to use the sequential model or the functional API. These are the two basic modes of Keras, how to build a neural network, or how to define a neural network with Keras. So the sequential models um, are the simplest way to define a neural network and um, they are suitable for most cases, but they require that your neural network consists of a linear order of layers. So you are restricted to have one input and one output, and the information flow has to be in it, has to go in a linear fashion from input to output through all the layers. So if that's something that is, is not complex enough, you can also use the functional API in Keras and this allows you to build more complex models. And it's usually used if you have multiple inputs or outputs. Let's say you have a model where you have images, but you also have the caption of an image. So you have image input and you have text input. Then you would have to use the functional API to build a model with multiple inputs. So the basic thing you will always encounter in Keras is dealing with layers. You will have an input layer, you will have an output layer, you will have lots and lots of different layers that you will encounter when you work with it. Some of them are dropout layers, you have noise layers, pooling layers, convolutional layers, normalization embedding, embedding layers, LSTM layers, all kinds of different layers. 
And you can combine them with functions like activation functions for each layer. You have regularization techniques, optimization functions. And of course, you can save models, layers, and weights to use them later to predict things. So this is how you think of the pyramid if you build a Keras model. You start with your API. Let's say you start with a sequential model. Then you define the model by adding layers. And it will become clearer, I think, if we go to the coding section in a minute, just so that you have already an idea what's going to happen. And once you have defined your layers, you can add functions like um, you have to define the loss function, you have activation functions, optimization functions, and so on. And finally, you have to define metrics that you use to measure the performance, like accuracy, um, mean squared error, whatever you want. So the practical part, convolutional neural networks. And I promise you, you will get to coding in a minute. Just a few more words about confnets before we actually build a confnet. Um, confnets or convolutional neural networks or CNNs are typically used to classify images. And an image in this case can be classified to show um, just to, to belong to just one class. And this is the, the this is what we will be doing with our fruits images. So we will have a set of images that can belong to one of n classes. So let's say this image belongs to the class tree. A similar task um, that you can also do is called object detection. This would be the case where you want to detect objects within images. But this is not what we are going to be doing today. We will just be doing entire image classification. And if we have input images, our data, in this case is the image, looks like this. So the simplest way is um, having black and white images. And black and white images, in terms of how we see them as data, consist of a two-dimensional matrix where each position in the matrix is a pixel value. And a pixel value in the um, case of a black and white image can range from zero to 255. So um, I think I'm mixing this up very often. I'm thinking zero is black and 255 is uh, white. And each position has this, the information of basically how light or how dark this pixel is. And if you look at the entire image, this is what you would see. Colorful images are not that different data-wise. They just don't consist of one two-dimensional by two, uh, one two matrix, but of typically three. And each two-dimensional matrix consists of the pixel values for one of the color channels. So in this case, we have R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. And we have the same pixel values from zero to 255 in each of these color channels. And combined, they make up the image that we see as a, let's say the image of a banana. So the confnet will now take this image data and um, learn representation of the data by going from um, abstract forms like edges, lines, through more complex forms, let's say they are shapes or more complex um, patterns, to a more to specific patterns and build up basically a pipeline of learning different abstractions of the original Im image to end up at an output and perform a similar classification task as I described before. So here's a bit more about CNNs and all the things that um, are highlighted here are words that you should keep in mind because you will encounter them in Keras in a minute. And the first one is the sliding window. Um, you have your image here with all your pixel information. And if you, have, um, if you want to define your Keras model, you will have to tell it how big should the sliding window be. So what size should the sliding window be? And the sliding window is often three by three pixels or sometimes five by five pixels. And what this means is that we have a window of this size, let's say three by three, and we start sliding the window across our image. 
typically from left to, from top left to um, bottom right. So we would go across once, then we go one lower and we go across again. So in the end, we will have um, covered each of our pixels several times with the sliding windows. And what happens in the sliding window is that each time the sliding window gets uh, applied, so it will be applied once and then it moves one over, we will apply it again. Each time we apply the sliding window, we will use a filter to calculate an output from this sliding window. So from the pixels in each sliding window. So a filter can be any number, but typically we have something, have filters that would recognize um, horizontal or vertical lines or even other patterns. And um, it's a bit abstract to understand now, but I have a few examples in a minute. So what these filters do, they detect shapes and patterns. And by sliding our window across our image and by applying the filter every time we have our sliding window, um, we will transform the image to, um, um, to make some, some certain shapes appear more strongly, for example. So filters are also what you will have to define in Keras. So not which filter, but how many filters. And I will talk about this later in more detail. For now, something else that you will have to tell Keras is the padding. Um, padding means how do you want to treat the fake border pixels? Um, because if you think about your sliding window and you think about how you would slide it across your image, you have to, you, you, uh, it's clear that if you just slide it across the image as it is, all your border pixels will only be shown to the sliding window, shown to the filters um, let's say once in case of the, um, the outer edge pixel. But what you want is for each pixel, or usually, not always, but usually you want to have all your pixels be shown to the filters the same number of times. So in order to achieve that, we use fake pixels around the edges of the image so that our starting window basically starts um, here and not in our image. Another thing you will have to tell Keras is the so-called stride. And stride means how much overlap do you want to have um, between sliding windows. So typically you slide your window one pixel to the right or the bottom, but you could also increase the stride and let's say our sliding image should go two or three pixels to the right or bottom. So now once we have this and we apply our filters, what we will achieve is a so-called feature map. And this will become also clearer if you actually code with Keras because then you can see in the output what this means. But our feature map is just a stack of feature maps and a feature map is the output of one filter. And I will show you what this means to make it more clear in, a Keras, um, in the Keras setup. Pooling layers is something that has been used for a long time. It's not being used as much now. But if you use pooling layers, this just means you reduce the compute time by boiling information down to, so reduce the, the image. Let's say you take another sliding window, but this time for each sliding window, um, let's say you choose the maximum value. This is called max pooling. So you would reduce your image um, by here, you have three by three, and you would just keep the maximum value and then go through the next pixels and repeat the same. So convolution and pooling are the traditional um, common setups of a CNN. And usually they have been um, interchangeably combined. So you have one or two convolutional layers typically, then you have a pooling layer and you repeat until you end up with a fully connected dense layer and um, feed it into the output. And I guess this is all very abstract if you have never seen Keras and have never worked with it, but I think it will become clearer once you actually um, see the code. Just before we start um, the summary, why are um, CNNs now better at using, um, better to use for image classification than let's say the multi-layer perceptron. Um, the really, really big thing about CNNs is that the pixels are considered as a group of connected information now. So 
just before, because we had our dense layers in the MLP, every input data would get sent to every node. So all the information is independent of each other, basically. It is computationally pretty fast, um, but if you have something like images or even text, it is important to consider each pixel as a context of other pixels or as a context of words, if you have a word, uh, if you have a, a text model. So it is important to use these uh, sliding windows because now we don't have to look at pic one pixel at a time, but we can actually look at pixels in combination with the surrounding neighboring pixels. So we now analyze chunks. And the big difference learning wise for our neural network is that before we learned the weights and now we actually learn the filters. And what this means will become clearer in a minute, I think. So this is it for the, um, for the theoretical part, very, very fast. And you will be able to understand better, I think, once you see the code. And for the code, we will go to um, to our studio, and I have to share my screen again. Let's see. Okay. Is it big enough, or should I increase the um, font size? It's okay. Great. Okay. So this is the link to the repository where you find the slides and all the code. If you want, you can clone this repository now. I will have to set it to public still, I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if I have done this yet, but I will do it right now. So in this um, repository, you will be able to check it out. I will not leave it on public um, for that long. <laughs> I'm not sure how long I will leave it for. Probably I will make it private again after the tutorial um, so that, uh, or maybe I will leave it public. I'm not sure. Maybe I will set it back to private, but you will be able to download everything right now if I find this here. Project is public now. So if you want to start coding along, you are free to do so right now. If you just want to listen and look at everything um, later, that's also fine. My screen sharing has stopped, right? Yeah. Now you can see everything again. Great. Um, let me find the chat again so that I can see your questions. <laughs> All right. So um, I will be working in the general setup of our studio. Um, I'm not sure if everybody is going to use the same, but um, this is how I will be working with Keras and R here today. So I'm using a um, R Studio project, and this is actually here the repository that you will be able to clone from, from the GitLab link here gitlab.com slash g slash keras underscore tutorial underscore user 2020. And um, in this repository here on the right are all the files. You should see most of these files. I have a few of them in git ignore, but the important ones you have. <laughs> the important thing that you can have a look later is the keras cheat sheet. So everything I just uh, mentioned very briefly and even more is on the keras cheat sheet. And in the folder, oops, sorry, Keras workshop material, here you find the um, code. The setup code is again in the 00setup.rmd. And you can have a look at this again. If the setup um, installation didn't work for you, you can go through this again and see if this would change something. All right. So. We start with the practical part. And as you can see, I have added a lot of text actually to this R Markdown file. And if you um, want to go over it in detail later after the tutorial, I want to 
maybe didn't get get everything I've been saying here because it's so fast. I know I, I'm telling you lots and lots of information in a very short time and it's basically impossible to remember everything. I hope I have written down most of it, at least everything that's um, that you need to know to understand Keras. So I will not be reading this out now, of course, but it's for you just to read up again later. So we will start by loading the library's Keras. And I'm also loading the tidyverse because I enjoy working with the tidyverse and I think it's the best way to deal with the data analysis in a tidy way. <laughs> if you have not been working with tidyverse, I highly suggest checking it out, but you don't have to, to work with Keras. You can also use Bazaar. So the first thing we need to do is load our images. And the data I told you to download from Kaggle, the fruits data set. And um, you can save it basically anywhere. You just have to tell um, or have to, just have to give the path where your images are stored. So in my case, the images are stored here on the documents GitHub data fruits 360. And in, if you open this folder, you will see that there are two folders. One is called training and one is called test. And the training folder contains most of the images and is designed to use the images for training. And the test folder contains fewer images, but they are um, saved in the same way. So um, let's look at them. I will just define here now the file path. And if I list all the files, let's say in the training images, you see all the folders that you have here, lots and lots and lots of fruits. And you will actually see all the same folders in the test part of the Fruits360 data set, just with fewer images per folder. So this is not yet Keras. But the next thing we are doing is preparing everything for reading the, the images into Keras. And um, the way we will be doing this here is to use something called the image data generator. Um, you also have the option, so let's say you look at, uh, you can also go to the Keras help page for more information. Um, I think it's keras.rstudio.com or rstudio.keras.com. Just Google RStudio and Keras, then you will go to the, come to the right page. They will also have examples where they work with images. I think the basic example is still the, um, the, the digits one, one MNIST. And there what they are doing is they um, convert, so they read every image basically into R, convert it into um, a multidimensional array and um, create the data set this way. So you don't have to read images in with the, with the um, image data generator. But typically, if you are working with images, it's the much better way to use the image data generator because um, the image data generator allows you to have a big set of images without having to read all the images in at once and have to keep them in RAM. But what the image data generator does is it will know the, the destination, so it will know where on your computer these images are stored. And during training, it will read in the images only when it needs them. So it will be much less efficient, uh, much more efficient to use the image data generator um, if you have a big set of images. Yeah, what is there? Sorry, I'm sharing. Um, can yeah. you um, increase the font of your of the screen? Yes. So many participants are complaining that the font is very small. Can you increase is it? that big enough or should I increase it even more? Um, is it okay now? Can you comment in the chat if um, it is okay now? Okay, so can I increase it a little bit? Okay. Let's make it a bit smaller here. Okay, it's better now. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. I'm good to go. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's actually start reading in 
our images. Or maybe I shouldn't even say reading in because we are not actually reading everything in at once. We are preparing our function for reading batches of images in during training. So we are using the image data generator to do that. And in order to um, have a model that trains a little bit faster and to reduce the complexity a little bit, I don't want to classify each of these um, folders. So each folder in our data is one type of fruit. And it's lots and lots of folders. I don't even know how many, but at least um, too many to show you the principles of Keras. We just want to, or I just want to show you the principle on, I think it's 16 folders. And I picked more or less randomly 16 folders here from all the folders that we have. You can, if you play around with it, you can change them out and see if this changes your model. If you have to change some other things, you can um, have more or less however you want. But in this case, I chose 16 fruits that I want to classify with my Keras model. So I write them into a vector called fruits list or fruit list. Um, I also define an object with the number of classes I have now. So this should be 16. Let me run this code. So output n is 16. And you will see why I use this later because I want to make sure I have the correct number um, for the output layer in my Keras model later. And if I change something here, it will automatically change the output layer in Keras. Another thing I want to do to um, reduce the calculation time and the complexity is to scale down the images. The original images are already relatively small. They are 100 by 100 pixels, but because they are pretty um, uniform, the model trains well, even if we reduce the image size in this case to 20 by 20 pixels. So our target size for our image is now 20 by 20. So image width by image height. And we also give the information that we have color images. So we have three channels and the default for Keras is RGB. This is important to note if you have um, other images, if you work with your own images, for example, because some programs work with uh, a different order of channels. So the default is red, green, blue, but some um, programs work with, I think, blue, green, red. I don't really know which order they use, but um, you have to be careful that you don't mix them up. All right, this is just some housekeeping. We have defined a few convenience functions here so that we don't have to copy paste numbers later on. And I'm also defining the batch size right now. And the batch size means that we will be reading in our images, as I told you, once they are needed. So the image data generator we are um, creating now will um, be fed into the Keras training function um, and what it will do, it will load batches of images. So let's say we have the batch size of 32. What will happen is that 32 images will be chosen. They will be um, sent through the neural network. So basically what I told you in the uh, theoretical part, they will go through the neural network. The um, score will be calculated. The activation function will be applied. We will compare to the one not encoded vector We'll have our error, we'll back propagate the error, <laughs> we will apply our optimization function, and we will um, go through the next step, basically the next epoch, by adjusting our weights and going through the entire process again. And batch size of 32 means now that all of our images will be looked at, but they will be looked at in batches of 32 images. So, the image data generator function. Um, just a note at the side, um, all these functions basically have the same name as the original Keras Python version of the code has. So if you ever want to um, 
look at examples for other Keras um, models or for our other Keras networks, because you have a model where you don't know how to start, you can always look at examples of other people, how did they build a Keras model. You often find more Python versions for models than for R, but it doesn't really matter because the function names are very, very similar. I think they have some, some naming conventions um, with camel case instead of the underscore version, but you can generally recognize which uh, function is, is the equivalent in R. So the image data generator is something we define first. And the image data generator, as you can see, um, allows us to um, adjust our image. And the thing that we are doing here is we want to rescale all our images by one divided by 255. And the reason I'm doing this is that the original pixel values of our images lie between zero and 255, just as I explained before. They are um, the standard pixel values. But for neural networks, it's often advantages if the values in our tensors lie between zero and one. And this just has to do with uh, matrix multiplication and um, the fact that the way our neural network learns, it's easier if the numbers are in a smaller range and uh, it's more efficient for the network to adjust weights and to, to um, optimize with if these values are between zero and one and they are standardized. So we are actually doing this by dividing every pixel value by 255. So we will have our values to fall between zero and one. Um, the things I've commented out here are options for data augmentation. I'm not using this here. I've just left it in as an example for you. If you um, have a model with your own images, for example, and you don't have that many images. So let's say you only have a couple hundred images per class and the power is not enough to train a good model. What sometimes helps is to augment the data. And data augmentation simply means that you take your images and you use the image data generator just as before. So every time um, the training is run, it will pick, pick, pick batches of images. So let's say a batch of 32 images. But if you use data augmentation, it will not take the image as it is, but it will change the pixel in a certain way. And this is how, what you define here. A rotate, rotation range of 40 means that it might rotate the image up to 40 degrees. Or a width shift or a height shift range, it might um, adjust the height or the width of the images or do some other interesting things with it to basically just change the images a little bit. And now what comes into play if we use data augmentation is that we don't only look once at each image as we do um, in the normal way as we do with our example here. So each image will pass through training once per epoch. But if we use data augmentation, we want every image to pass through training um, several times per epoch. And every time it passes through the training, it will be changed in a slightly different way. So we artificially increase our sample size, basically. So this we define for our training data. But training alone is usually not a good way to measure the performance of our model. Because if we train our data on a set of images, we have it learn just this set of images. So we will have it learn a task on a reduced subsample of what we call like the real world. <laughs> And if we apply this model then to other images, let's say we want to predict fruits of other images, it will probably be really, really bad, even though it was really, really good on our training data. And the reason is that our training data was so specific and it basically learned our training data by heart, optimized on this training data alone, and then wasn't able to generalize to other images anymore. So one thing we can do to improve this a little bit is to use validation data during training. So this means during training, our model performance and model optimization will not be performed on a training data, but on a validation set. 
So on a separate set of images that is not used to adjust the weights, uh, not, not used to uh, measure the performance, but on a, yeah, just left out to um, get a more independent um, idea of how well our model is learning. Of course, if we are using something like the fruits data set, we have to keep in mind that the validation data is basically the same as the training data. It's not the exact same images, but the images basically look exactly the same. So they all have fruits in a different way on there with a white background and the fruit really centered. So it's not something that you can expect to really enable our model to generalize beyond this very strict framework of images, but it's still better than just using training data. So we define another image, image data generator just for the validation data this time. And the validation data, if you remember, came from this other folder that's here in the Fruits360 data called the test folder. And something else you should note here, um, data augmentation is always only done for the training data never for validation data. Oh, well, let's say not never, but typically it shouldn't be done. <laughs> All right, and now we go <clears throat> to the heart of the matter. We load our images. And for this, we use the flow images from directory function. And this just takes the image data generator we just defined. Oh, sorry, this is here. We give it the file path where it has to look for these images. We give the target size. The target size was what I defined up here, where I wanted to reduce the size of the images. I also tell it the class mode, in this case, categorical, because we have a classification task. This means different categories of images. And this is optional. You can give it a vector of classes if you don't want to have each of the fruits um, classified just a subset. And if you remember, the subset was this vector of folder names that I defined before. If you didn't include this um, line of code here, what would happen is that every folder that's in the train image file path. So all of the fruit folders here will be taken as one class. And per default, flow images from directory considers um, the, the image, the file structure in a certain way. And this is in this folder here. So in the training folder, it would expect to have a certain number of subfolders. And the name of each subfolder is a class label to predict. So it would expect to have the images sorted already to belong into certain classes. And each class has to, has, has to have its own folder and the folder name will be, yeah, what's called the class label in this case. So here, because I don't want to use all of them, I just define a subset. I also give the batch size, so how many images should be processed in batch. And they see it to have, um, so this is not necessary for training a model, but it's just for replication purposes to have a pseudo random number generator starting from the same point so that everything will end up the same if you repeat the process. And I'm doing the analog for validation images, just that I'm using here the file path and the image data generator for validation data. All right. Now you can double check that everything works as expected because it will tell you how many images were found and how many folders. So in this case, 7,709 images belonging to 16 classes. And for the validation data, 2,592 images also in 16 classes. So just look at how many, let's look at how many images we have per class. So here we have the table you can see here. 
And the first thing you probably note is that if you go back up to your files, and here I listed all the files in the training data, was that they had nice human readable names, right? You had papaya, you had pepper, plum, whatever. And even the fruit list I defined here also had the nice human readable names. I know what a banana is, I know what a strawberry is, and so on. But all of a sudden, all these names are gone. <laughs> all of a sudden, what we have, have here are numbers from 0 to 15. And this is something that Keras does in the background always, is to convert the um, class labels into indices. And it starts with 0 because Python is 0 indexed, while R is one index, so very common problem you encounter um, is that Python always starts counting with zero and R starts counting at one. So if you work with Keras, be sure to keep that in mind. It's a Python package and Python starts counting at zero. <laughs> so here we now have all these indices. But in order to make them human readable again, we have to be able to map them back to the original human readable labels. And this is actually stored in the train image array generator I defined above, um, and then the, in something called class indices. So this is what you can see here, class label versus index mapping. And you can note that the order is actually the order I chose in the um, vector of subset of images here in the fruit list. So it starts with kiwi, banana, and so on, ends with pomegranate. And this is actually the same order that Keras kept when it converted the labels to indices. So kiwi has the index zero and pomegranate has the index 15. And this is just something we keep for predicting later on um, so that we know what's what. <laughs> All right, yeah, let's save this as a separate object to have it for later. So this is just what I showed you before the index. And another thing I want to have as a separate object to paste later on is the number of training images and the number of validation images. I already know that it should be 7,000 something and this should be 2,000 and something just to double check, yes. That's correct. Are there any questions up to this point? Let me have a quick look. I think okay, so, uh, little... for now, I think majority of the question has been resolved. So please, if you have any question, just share it on Gita and we'll take it up from there. So Sorry, I didn't understand you. I didn't really understand you just now. Yeah, I said majority of the question that was asked has been resolved. Ah, okay. So um, yeah, so if you can please be able to use Gita if you have any question. So we'll bring this shorter um attention to it. What's this time? I'm having a bit of um connection issues, so I don't really understand you, but um you can type the questions in the chat here. I have the chat open, so. <laughs> How is a picture labeled as a pepper? So this is um, by having this folder subfolder structure. So as I showed you before, we have this um, folder called training. And training here, this is the folder training, list files, and this path gives you a number of subfolders. And Keras, if you use the flow images from directory function, assumes that your, um, f you, that your file path that you give it contains a number of subdirectories and each subdirectory contains images. So each image, let's say in the folder chestnut is expected to show a chestnut. So you have to make sure if you use your own data that they are labeled correctly and sorted in the correct folders. 
because Keras will take chestnut as a class label and say every image that's in this folder is a chestnut and this is what I will learn. I hope that answered the question. Um, how did I decide the image size to scale down? Basically just trial and error. <laughs> I tried before with 100 by 100 pixels. The model was super, super good. I thought, all right, these images are very uniform. The task is pretty simple. Um, let's try to scale them down pretty drastically. If you have more complex images, you probably won't get away with scaling them down this much, but here it works. <laughs> how to learn, how to choose or select the optimal parameters. Um, the best way is to use hyperparameter tuning. So you would typically um, start by looking at uh, similar examples that you find on the internet. So if I have, um, let's say I want to train a um, CNN, a, a convolutional neural network, I just look at what other people did with similar networks. And then I go to the hyperparameters and I would um, tune them. Um, I can actually, after this, uh, post a link to the hyperparameter tuning site um, where you find some information about how to do this in Keras. Yeah, and we will talk about convolutions um, when we define the model a bit more. All right, this is just what we did. So now let's go more explanation here. <laughs> I define the number of epochs here um, to be 10. This is also something you can play around with. And we will talk about this more when we talk about um, if we go to callbacks, um, just to keep in mind here, you could use a much higher number and use a callback uh, for early stopping. But in this case, I just played around with it enough to know that 10 is a suitable number. So epochs is defined here, line 226 for yeah, the person who asked. Um, here I have a little excursion about how a computer sees images, but I will skip this in, because the time is already advanced. This is just to show you how Keras or how, how the computer looks at the images, you see actually the pixel values here. You can look at that later if you want. So we are going to the interesting part. Our Keras model, woohoo! <laughs> we actually have something called Keras here. So because we are using a simple model, I will be working with the sequential model here. And what you do first is before you define your model is you initialize the model by calling the Keras model sequential function and give it a name. So a few things to know before are that um, if you have worked with the tidyverse before, you will be familiar with the pipe operator, this weird sign percent bigger than percent is the pipe operator in R. And um, it's very prominently used in the um, um, in the tidyverse where it's used to have some input, let's say some data, you pipe it to another function and then you pipe it again and again and again so that you have a workflow of transformations of your data and you have go to an output. What the tidyverse does with the pipe operator, it never modifies the original object. So let's say you start with data um, have a pipe operator and five functions, then the output will be printed, but the original data will not be modified. This is different in Keras. In Keras, these objects will get modified in place. This is really, really, really important to know because once you do something with the pipe operator here, it will directly change this object. So. I am first initializing my model and this is what I've done. And now I'm building a relatively simple, yeah, I will talk about what these parameters are <laughs> in a minute. 
um, I will build a very simple convolutional neural network. And I do this by adding layers. I already told you the basic of Keras is to work with layers. And um, the layer we are using now for two-dimensional convolutions is called layer conf 2D. And here you will encounter all these hyperparameters again that I briefly mentioned in the practical part on my slides. And I will explain them here a bit more because I think it becomes clearer now. So let's make this a bit easier to see. So our first convolutional layer. And convolution 2D just means that we have a two-dimensional sliding window that we want to use. All right. The first hyperparameter we define is the filter. And I told you before that um, when I explained how a multi-layer perceptron learns, it's by learning the weight. So it will optimize the weight in a certain way to reduce the error. And the weight is just basically any number. It can be a number. You can just think of it as any number. <laughs> and we will change the number in a certain way to reduce the error. What the CNN does, it's not learning weights, it's learning filters. And a filter, in this case, a filter with the kernel size three by three, is just a two-dimensional matrix with three rows and three columns. And um, what happens now, let me go to Chrome. I think I can show you very quickly if I find it, image filters. Um, I will share my screen in a minute once I find the correct site. All right, there it is. Here you go. So this is a really neat site. I will copy the link in the R markdown for you to look at. That explains how filters work. So here you see a three by three filter. Just a two dimensional matrix with numbers in it. So this is now any filter. You have different filters. So these are predefined filters. Let's say, um, yeah, sharpen is fine. And what happens now is that this filter here, this is our sliding window three by three, will go across the image from left to right and from top to bottom. And every time we apply our filter, we um, multiply the positions. You can see this here. Let's see if I can, no, if I move my cursor, it will not show anymore, but you can see it in the middle. So you have the pixel values, 255, 110, 96, and so on and so on. So here actually zero is black and 255 is white. And we multiply each position in this two by two array with the corresponding position of our filter. And now we add all this up. So this is just a simple dot product. We add this up and we end up with 44. So this is our output of this filter at this specific position in the image. And on the right, you will see the output of this filter for this image. It sharpened all the edges. So this is just the image, what, an Im what a filter does. A filter applies a dot product calculation for every sliding window and will in this way modify the image. Okay, let's go back to R. So we defined 32 here. And what does this mean? This basically means that we want our neural network to learn 32 filters in our first convolutional layer. So it will basically optimize each of these numbers in our filter to find the optimum way how to modify the image at each step to um, go through the output basically, to predict the output as best as, as good as possible. 
And if I show you the model in a minute, you will see where the 32 ends up. Just keep that in mind for now. Padding same. Padding was this fake border pixel thing that we did because we want to have all of our pixels seen the same number of times by our sliding window. We create a border of fake pixels. And by saying padding equals same, we just say um, use the same pixel value of the border pixels and replicate them to the left or, or to the outside, basically. We could also use zero padding. This will just create a border of zeros around the image. Something else you have to keep in mind if you use Keras is that uh, if you use the sequential API, the first hidden layer, so in this case, our convolutional layer, has to have the input shape. So um, maybe this is a bit unintuitive if you are used to working with R, where usually if you um, run some function, the function will automatically get evaluated right away. This is not the case in Keras. So what we do here is we have a, let's say, a whiteboard, and we draw on the whiteboard how we want our neural network to look like. So we are basically are an architect, and we um, think in our head, mm, maybe I have one convolutional layer with 32 filters, and then another, and I just write this down. Nothing gets calculated here, nothing. It's just writing down how I want the architecture to look like. So, and the input shape tells the neural network later what number of um, pixels to expect in the image width, in image height, and the number of channels. So this is the image dimension it expects, 20 by 20 by 3. And if you try to put images in that are, let's say, 100 by 100 by 3, it will throw an error. So you have to give the input shape. So then, after the first convolution, I act, add an activation layer, this time rectified linear units. And I add another convolutional layer. And by the way, everything here gets combined with the pipe operator. So in our second hidden layer, we want to have 16 layers, another 3 by 3 kernel, another padding. After that, I just to show you, I mean, this is basically just playing around to show you the a few of the um, different options you have with Keras. You could also use, again, activation ReLU here. Um, just to show you, there's also something called leaky ReLU. Um, I'm not going to explain all these advanced things here, but if you're interested, you can look them up and see what they are. Um, then we have a pooling layer. So here, a pooling size of two by two. And what this does, you will see in a minute. We have a dropout layer. Dropout just means it will randomly set, in this case, um, 25% of all our um, all our nodes to zero um, to improve generalization. After that, we flatten everything into a dense layer. This is something we need in order to convert the high dimensionality of the convolutional filters and the, the feature maps that we can get from these um, to go into our output layer. And our output layer has to have the number of classes that can be predicted. In this case, 16. That's why I defined this output n object before, because we need to have 16 nodes in our output layer, one node for every possible class. And here you see I'm adding the softmax activation function. And this I showed you in the slides was the way how to transform the scores that are calculated into a probability distribution. And finally, I'm compiling my model by adding the loss I want to use to optimize. And in this case, because we have a classification task, we are using categorical cross entropy. There are other um, losses, of course. You can even write your own custom loss functions. And there are lots of optimizers you can use. In this case, I'm using RMS prop. You could also use um, st um, stochastic gradient descent. If you want to know all the options you have, you can start typing question mark optimizer. And our studio will automatically suggest all the optimizers you have here. Optimizer SGD is st stochastic gradient descent.
All right, so I'm defining this model and let's look at the model to explain a bit more what all these filters actually do. So the summary of our model shows you the layers we have here and it shows you the output shape. So the output shape is interesting to get an understanding of what happens now with all these filters. So here, this is just for the batch, this doesn't matter right now. We have 20 pixels width, 20 pixels height. And our first convolutional layer, we said we wanted to learn 32 filters. So here we have the 32. And this means each filter, each of the 32, will be a different three by three matrix with different numbers in it. So a different filter that is applied. And um, so we will end up with a stack of 32 matrices, 20 by 20. And each of these 32 matrices is the output of one of this, these filters. So this is now our dimensionality. Then these get combined back into one. And in our second convolutional filter, we wanted to learn 16 filters. So now here we have the 16, um, the feature stack of, fifth, of 16 and so on. Until we come to max pooling, where you can see that now, so here in our convolutions, we always change the third dimension, right? And now we come to max pooling and here you see the third dimension remains the same, but the first and second dimension here, so the pixel width and height of our images gets reduced down. And this is because max pooling, in this case I had a two by two sliding window, only keeps the highest value of each of these two by two windows. So we basically reduce the image size by half here. And this you can see. And then we flatten all this out. So 10 by 10 by 16 ends up being 1,600. It's just that here we had um, a stack of 16 feature maps, all the size of 10 by 10. If we flatten them out, we, this just means we um, break break the context. So here we still have the context of each pixel. So we know the neighbors of each pixel, we know the corresponding value in all of the 16 stacks. But if we flatten everything out, we basically make them independent. <clears throat> we consider them now all independent. So we flatten them out <clears throat> in order to be able to go to our 16 output layers. You always get the number of um, how many parameters are being calculated here. This is just interesting to compare and see how big your model gets. Um, right. And now we fit. So until now, Keras did no computational calculation whatsoever, nothing, just, just on the whiteboard. But when we start the fit generator, this is when training actually happens. Um, the general function is called fit and in future functions of R, it will um, even throw you an, a warning if you use the fit generator. Um, with the older um, versions, you had to use fit generator if you were using a data, gen data generator. So this is what I'm using here, but in newer versions, the fit function alone will automatically be able to handle generators. Um, if it encounters one. But here I've kept it just in the old way, just to be clear. So if we run the fit generator, we give it the training data, and this is the image data generator with flow from directory def we defined before. So this tells the generator where to look for the images, how many images to process in a batch, and basically what classes to um, consider and so on. We also define the number of steps per epoch. This is relevant if you had data augmentation, you would want to increase the steps per epoch so that each image gets seen more than once. But here I um, divided the number of training samples by the batch size so that each image would be seen once during each epoch. And the same I'm doing for the validation data. 
And when I started the fit generator, you can already see that R, uh, that Keras gives us a nice output here. It tells us the number of epochs it's um, working at, so one of 10 and the different steps, how long it took, the loss, the accuracy and the validation loss. And it will print this for every epoch. And if you are using RStudio, the viewer pane will automatically open with this plot that shows you the validation, uh, the loss and the accuracy for training data and for validation data. So we now have to wait a little bit and see how our model performs. And then let me go to the chat again to see if there are questions. So. Yeah, I've seen this error a lot. I'm not sure why you get this error that there is no pill image. Mm. Yeah, the number of parameters. So I just picked them because, uh, yeah, I experimented with them a little bit and I, I picked something that works fine. But if you don't know anything and you're starting from scratch, you would have to do hyperparameter tuning. And um, I will copy um, a link that gives you more information about hyperparameter tuning. Is there a way to parallelize this? Yes, there is. Um, typically, if you have a small model, I just use my CPU, but you could, of course, um, use the GPU version. Is it because uh, you mean the error? I don't know if that's the question, but um, yeah, we are using the CPU version. If you had bigger images, it would make sense to use the GPU version. But of course, your computer has to support the correct GPU, or you would have to um, use, let's say, um, an AWS instance or something else where you have a GPU running. Yeah, you can, of course, if you run GPUs, you can um, scale them to run on, let's say, an AWS cluster or something else. What CPU and memory do I have? Good question. I think I have 16 gigabyte RAM. And the CPU I have should be... Um, a 2.9 gigahertz quad core Intel core i7. <laughs> Not sure why you get this pill error for displaying the load images because I was pretty sure that load image is not something from a Python package, <laughs> but it's something from an R package. I'm not sure. You mean, could this approach be useful for non-image classification is one question. And I guess you mean this approach, you mean a CNN? And CNNs are typically used for image classification or for simple text classification. And if you use text, you would not want to use um, these functions um, um, conf2d, but conf1d, because in text, we don't have two-dimensional sliding windows, but one-dimensional sliding windows, but you would consider them more or less the same. So you would slide across, let's say, sentences or words, and you would consider um, a word or letter in context of what's before and what's after it. So that's why I can also use convolutions. Um, one question is, I saw that most people use Python to build models with Keras. Is it a general practice to use Python for Keras? Um, yeah, actually more or less, let's say. I mean, it has somehow <laughs> been established that um, most data scientists tend to use Python for the hardcore calculation stuff. And this is because, um, I think because R tends to be a bit slow sometimes and the RAM um, aspect makes it a little bit tricky. Um, but yeah, a lot of people use Python 
with um, Keras, but I think this is also because most people don't really know that it's possible to use R. Um, you just have to know a few tips and tricks and then you can use R. If you go to keras.rstudio.com, um, you will find a few examples of really complex things like um, deep dreaming, for example, all built in R and it's running just fine. I think it's just uh, this weird competition between Python and R and what's better and what's not and who is a serious data scientist. Yeah. <laughs> what is the desired output of your network? Is it a numerical 2D or 3D matrix? What should be the output layer in this case? Um, the output layer should always be the number of classes you predict. So each class needs to have one output node. So in our case, we have 16 possible classes. So our output layer has to have 16 nodes. And this is because we want to have a score calculated for each of the possible classes, which we can then convert into the probability distribution. And this means that if we have more than two classes, we should use the softmax activation function to do this. If we had just two classes, we could also use a sigmoid activation function and just one node in the output layer because, um, of course, if we um, classify two classes, then our um, input is in one or the other class. So if it's in one class, it's automatically not in the other. So we don't need two output nodes there. If we have a regression task, of course, we also um, just need one node because then a number is calculated and we don't need a softmax function. Another question, how do you deal with input that might not belong to any class that the model was trained for? Yeah, that's not possible with this type of model. You, <laughs> um, the way we defined this here, it will predict one of the 16 classes. It, doesn't handle, um, it doesn't belong to any class, for example. You would have to explicitly train your model this way, or you could do um, a multi-output model and um, calculate an, a separate output for different classes so that one image, for example, can belong to two classes or none. All right, let me just very quickly go over this, the rest of this file. So. Um, the hist object here, you can plot it and it will just plot the curves you saw in the viewer pane in our studio. Um, this is the number of epoch on the x-axis and the accuracy and loss on the y-axis and see how well your model learned during training. And the summary you see here. This is the final epoch and you see the loss, the accuracy, both for training and for validation. So because it's already um, almost 20 to five, I think we can discuss a few more images just um, to let you know. I've added another R markdown here where I'm discussing a few more things that are interesting if you're training models and you can look at them on your own if you want later. So here I'm actually covering how to use a validation split instead of a validation set. So the validation set was a predefined set of images that would always be used during validation. Here we have a validation split where we use, in this case, 30% of the training data as the validation data. And I'm also showing you here how to use a separate set of images. In this case, I'm using the test data here to predict new images. So you trained your model here um, and now you have a, data, a, a folder of new images which you want to predict. So you would have to define another image data generator and use evaluate generator or predict generator to predict using a model predict on new images. And the last thing I have included here, which we won't be able to cover due to time, but which you can look at, um, are a few callbacks. And one of the callbacks is used to save model checkpoints during training. 
or to use early stopping. If you, for example, don't know how many epochs your model will have to run, you just set the number of epochs to a very high number and tell it to monitor the validation loss and stop training once, let's say, the model doesn't improve by um, 0.01 or more for over three um, epochs. And um, you know how to visualize something with TensorBoard. But um, this is advanced stuff and you can look at it. So I'd say we talk a bit more so that at least the parts we did cover get understood by everyone. Okay. To predict new images, the pixel format has to be exactly the same as the training pixel. Yes, that is true. So um, you have to remember, <laughs> this is something, or at least something you have to define somewhere or remember. If you train a model like this, and you reduce the image size here for training and you save your model and let's say you want to deploy it somewhere and other people should be able to use it. They will have to know how you prepare the input data they, because the input data will A, have the same dimensions. So in this case, 20 by 20 by three. So it is not shown here, but you can see it here. The input shape, image width, image height, channel so it has to be 20 by 20 by 3. If your images are bigger you will have to scale them down before you can use the Keras model to predict on them. And what's also important you have to prepare them in exactly the same way. So here what we did if you remember is we scaled our pixel values to lie between 0 and 1. This is what we did in the image data generator here. Oops, here. So all your images that you are using, you cannot feed the raw pixel values into it. Otherwise it will do weird stuff <laughs> that you don't want. So all the images you want to predict with this Keras model will have to be scaled. Okay. Any book suggest suggestions or online resources? to learn. Yes, let me share my Chrome again to show you a few resources. Okay, the most obvious resource of course is keras.rstudio.com where you find all the information. So the package site tensorflow.rstudio.com is for a bit of advanced stuff. Mm, but here you also find a lot of tutorials and I think a lot of them include Keras automatically because this is now TensorFlow 2.0 and larger, um, which automatically or which is designed to have Keras as a core feature. And here you see a few, for beginners, a few um, um, tutorials and a bit more advanced stuff. So this is something worth checking out. And let me see if there's hyperparameter tuning actually here. Might be on their side. Mm, fine tuning, no. Maybe it was on the TensorFlow side. Yeah. So here you find something about hyperparameter tuning, how it works, um, how you prepare your script with these so-called flags here. So this is what you would do um, if you are starting from zero and for example, you want to play around with different numbers of filters, um, different dropouts, um, different number of um, hidden, uh, hidden nodes in flat layers, something like this. Um, another resource is the Keras cheat sheet that's included in the GitHub repository. And the book I recommend is um, by Francois Cholet. Um, it's called Deep Learning with R. Exactly here. Deep Learning with R. You can either buy it here. Doesn't want to load. So this is the book, which also has some code examples. Um, and the really cool thing about this book is that 
it has a GitHub repository with notebooks here. Let me copy this link and put it all in the R markdown. Um, I will push the changes after the tutorial and you have them all there. Let me put the resources here. So here you see there are actually a number of notebooks all in our markdown and the description what's in them you can find here. So there are some nice things using confnets, using pre-trained confnets, visualizing what they learn, um, some stuff about natural language processing and even more advanced stuff like deep dreaming, style transfer, GANs and so on. Okay, I'm also hyperparameter tuning. I will give you and the carousite. Um, where is my Zoom session? <laughs> There it is. Okay, where is the chat? <laughs> Always looking for something here. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, Francois Chaudet exactly is the main author of Keras. <laughs> he wrote the Keras Python package and um, wrote the book Deep Learning with Keras uh, in Deep Learning with Python about Keras and together with uh, JJ Allaire, the R version as well. Could you explain a bit more the loss accuracy graphs at the end? How do we know the model is giving good predictions? Mm -hmm. So let's go back to our graph. So what we are looking for when we train a model is um, the loss, most of all. If we have um, a classification task, obviously accuracy is also something. And the accuracy means how many images were um, predicted correctly. Because the, the model or Keras knows which folder our images come from. It knows the true label and it can be, compare the prediction against the truth basically and know how many images were predicted correctly in each epoch. So this is the accuracy. So the best possible accuracy is one. This would mean 100% all of the images were predicted correctly. And um, the loss is the loss function we, we defined. In this case, categorical cross entropy. And because the loss is a way to represent the error, we want our error or our loss function to go um, towards zero. So this is the general direction we want to take. Loss of zero, accuracy of one. And now we have training and validation data. And what will often happen is that your training loss will decrease just as you want it, or the accuracy will increase just as you want it. But what sometimes, what you can sometimes see is that your validation will just will drop at the beginning and then increase again, so that you have a very big difference between validation and training loss. And this is something you want to avoid because you are using the validation data explicitly so that your model is not overfitting on the um, training data. It's used to learn a general representation of the data that's able to work on images that are slightly different. So we want to have a model that's generalizable. So what we are looking for is the curves of training and validation to be close together actually. And of course, to go here towards zero and one. So these are the two important things. Towards zero, towards one, validation and training should be close together. Could you explain again the filter concept of CNN? What exactly learns the CNN by these filters? Okay, let's go back to the citosa.io site. Google Chrome. Damn it, I closed it. <laughs> Do I have it here? Yeah. So these are the pixels. 
uh, the, the filters, sorry. So you have different filters and there are a few filters that are, have been used like um, for a long time in image analysis and that are de predefined, you can say. So the simplest filter is the identity filter. And you see the filter here has zeros except for the one in the middle. And um, what happens now is again, here you see the red sliding window, three by three pixels, um, has the same size as our filter. And because these filters and the sliding windows are the same size, we can calculate a dot product of them. So um, the dot product takes the top left position of the filter, multiplies it with the top left um, pixel value in our sliding window. Then it takes the next position in the filter matrix and the next position in the sliding window, multiplies it and does this for every position in the filter matrix. And the dot product now means that we sum up all of these products. And we end up with a number. In this case here, we end up with 25. So this now gets transformed to the output. And because we have a sliding window, in this case, one that's um, always sliding one pixel to the right, respectively one to the bottom, our image on the right has the same size as the, the original image, except um, for the, the border. And this is because we have not used any padding here. And our, so let me, let me make this clear. I think you can see the red squares, right? Um, now the top left pixel has been seen once. And all the other ones in my setting window have also been seen once. Now I move it to the right. So the second pixel from the left in the first row has been seen twice and all the other ones right to it as well. And I move over. So now the third pixel from the top left has been seen three times. And if I go across now, you can see that all of these pixels have been seen several times except for the pixels at the borders, right? And if I wanted to avoid this, I would have to use this padding. So this is why here you see the image with this black border. Um, does this explain a bit more what filters do? So if we change the filter, we would have a different um, dot product and our filter output would look like this. So let's say we have our model learning all these different filters each of these outputs on the right would be one of the feature maps in our, feature, in our stack of feature maps, basically. Say we have this outline filter, we have a sharpened filter and so on. Yes, exactly. What is learned are actually the values here in these filters. So this is what's being optimized during training. What are some of the other applications for Keras outside image recognition? Mm -hmm. Very good example. If you go to the keras.io page and you want to see a few more examples, um, you can go to the examples tab here uh, on, the, on the top and you can find a few more examples here. You can, for example, see some more image stuff, but you see also a um, long short-term memory network. You can see deep dreaming. You can see um, generative adversarial networks. You can see image captioning, how to do style transfer, how to um, generate text here, for example. Lots of different stuff, style transfer, a few really cool things here, um, variation and autoencoders. You even see something with TensorFlow probability and you can look at them and see how this works. Oh, this is not working right now. Then let's go to Keras R Studio GitHub. There they should still have them. <laughs> uh, let me copy this as well. I think under R. There's embedding, no. 
vignettes yeah and their examples here you see um, all the examples and a few more that are not included on the site LSTM text generation uh, the R file I'm looking for where is it So here you can see an example how to do this. So you can read some text, do some pre-processing, and the Keras part is here. So you build the model, you define the model, you compile it, and that's that. So I copy this link also to the R Markdown. All right, one more question, I think. Optimal, someone is um there is a comma these values the aim is to find the optimal filter coefficients to recognize the pictures these values are chosen optimized such that they result in filters which are useful for extracting features which are relevant for deriving the correct class for each image yeah i think there is not much to it um yeah i think we should probably stop here any major question that's really 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 important which you cannot go to bed with <laughs> tonight on the deployment of the model cannot be deployed using plumber um i would think so but i've not tried but i think it should Will it choose several filters? Yeah, it will learn the number of filters we define in the filters um, hyperparameter. Um, yeah, there is has been a question about uh, Bonferroni limits and simultaneous statistics when we are optimizing the filters. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty complex answer that I would have to research in order to not tell you something wrong here. But yeah, hypothesis testing has been mentioned already. Um, yeah, we are it's it's a bit tricky <laughs> let me just leave it at that <laughs> how to deploy the model say using google cloud or aws um you can save the model maybe that's something worth showing you if you have go to save model you see you have the model um, hdf5 file ending which is a keras file ending so if you are working with keras you can save basically just the hdf5 you can save the tensorflow model format um, you can also just choose to save only the weights and you can then save this model and load load it again either into um, keras and what you would do what what's the best practice if you want to deploy it to a cloud service is that you have your model you strip it of all the layers that are not needed for inference so like dropout layers and stuff so that you just have the bare um, tensorflow graph and then you create a docker container and you deploy it to let's say aws okay there are really really a lot of questions still but i think we have to quit now due to the time um, you can keep asking questions on Gitter. I'm trying to answer as many as possible over the next few days, but uh, I have a small 14-month-old child, so not that much time, <laughs> but I will do my best. Organizers, any final comments from you? doesn't seem this way 
then thank you all very, very much. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the workshop. Uh, we are go, we are we are going to close the workshop now, and will you will you will have all the materials available online. And thank you, everybody. Bye. See you. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for participating. I hope this was helpful. <laughs>